Welcome to the unit, Dyeing Techniques. This unit introduces skills needed for the purpose of dyeing. Students will learn dyeing techniques through a combination of textual content and drawings. This unit comprises of three modules and a final assignment section that invites you to reflect on what you have learned. By the end of this unit, Students will be able to identify the materials and tools required for dyeing, describe the tie-dye techniques, describe the batik techniques. The first module introduces the different dyeing techniques. Dye is a natural or synthetic substance used to add a color to or change the color of something. According to Webster's Dictionary, dyeing is the process of coloring fibers, yarns or fabrics by using a liquid containing coloring matter for imparting a particular hue to a substance. Dyeing is achieved in a solution containing dye stuffs and the significant factors involved are temperature and time control. There are mainly two classes of dyes, natural and synthetic. During the process of dyeing, a chemical bonding is formed between the dye molecules and the fiber molecules. The primary source of dyes historically has been the nature wherein the dyes have been extracted from animals, plants and minerals. Since the mid 18th century, humans have produced artificial dyes to achieve a wider range of colors and make the dyes stable to washing and general use. Dyes used by the textile industry are largely synthetic, typically derived from coal tar and petroleum based intermediates. Textiles and dyed using a wide range of dye stuff, techniques and equipments. Different classes of dyes are used for different types of fibers and at different stages of the textile production processes from loose fibers to yarns, fabrics and completed garments. Dyes are available as powders granules, paste and liquid dispersions. There are four main stages of dyeing. In the fiber stage, both natural and man-made fibers can be dyed at this stage. It enables dyeing to be uniform. However, there is a lot of wastage during further processing of fiber. During the yarn stage, yarns are dyed especially when they have to be sold as such. Hence, in embroidery threads, sewing threads, knitting yarns, yarn dyed fabrics, dyeing is done at the yarn stage. In the fabric stage, most of the fabrics that are dyed in a single solid color are dyed at this stage. This method is fast and is easy to match colors. Blended fabrics can also be dyed. During the garment dyeing stage, sometimes after stitching of the garment, there are requirements to dye it. Fiber content determines the type of dye required for a specific fabric. Examples of cellulosic fibers are cotton, linen, jute, hemp, rami, bamboo and rayon. Cellulosic fibers 
require fiber reactive, direct or substantive and bad dyes which are colorless, soluble dyes fixed by light and or are oxygen. Examples of protein fiber are wool, angora, mohair, cashmere, silk, soy, leather and suede. Protein fibers require vat, acid or indirect or modern dyes that require a bonding agent. Examples of synthetic fibers are nylon, acrylic, polyester and polypropylene. Each synthetic fibers require its own dyeing method. For example, nylon requires acid, disperse and pigment dyes while rayon acetate requires disperse dyes. Resist dyeing is a, is a widely used method of applying colors or patterns to the fabric which involves dyeing only selected parts of a piece of fabric. A substance that is impervious to the dye blocks access to certain areas of the fabric while other parts are free to take up the dye color. Resist can be applied through threads or similar materials, clamping, stitching, mud, wax or starch. Tie dye and batik are some of the examples of simplest dye resist techniques which have been widely used traditionally in various parts of the world. Both the techniques have been covered in this unit. Tie dye involves pinching areas of cloth and tying them tightly with thread before dyeing. Removal of thread reveals small circular marks in the original fabric color. Complex patterns can then be built up by repeating the process using another dye color. The various tie dye techniques that are practiced in the world are Bandhani, Leheria, Mothra in India, Plangi in Indonesia, Tritik in Indonesia and West Africa and Shibori in Japan. In Japan, rice is used as the resist. This technique is called susugaki. In Java, wax is used and is called batik. Originally, the hot wax was applied with a shape strip of bamboo, but in the 17th century, the invention of the janting, a copper crucible with spouts of different sizes meant that the wax could more easily be applied in continuous lines of various thickness, thus improving the fineness of the patterns that could be attempted. The earliest batik were in monochrome patterns against an indigo background, but multicolored ones were produced from the 18th century onwards using methods learned from expert Muslim dyers in India. Typical patterns represented ancient symbolic designs in complex symmetrical intertwining layouts and reflected the social class of the owner through their levels of intricacy. Some of the ceremonial garments produced and decorated in this way are amongst the most superb example of textile ornamentation known. In India, beeswax resist was used for part of the fabric coloring process in the production of chintz, charcoal or other fugitive color materials was used to transfer the pattern onto the cotton cloth. A porous bag of loose charcoal powder called a pounce was dusted over a design pricked onto paper. Then the hot wax was drawn on a with a reed pen following the charcoal guidelines. The textile workers 
were largely low caste Hindu family groups, each family skilled in a separate stage of the complex chintz making process and working in their own small crafts workshop. In Batik, resist is obtained by applying wax on fabric as per a predetermined pattern and is known by the same term. After dyeing and removal of the wax, the pattern is revealed in the original fabric color. This process can be repeated several times to obtain various hues and shades of color. Flowering trees appear to spring out from a dense background composed of a diamond grid with a lar or garuda wings placed within each diamond. The kipala is composed of diamonds and triangular forms filled with floral patterns. These are the materials required for tie and dye. Bleached cotton fabrics such as malmal or muslin, cambric or poplin, cotton or polyester thread for tying, plastic sheet for design tracing, fugitive color for design transfer, pin or needle for marking holes in design sheet, direct dyes, water, thread, a cord for tying, stitching needle, steel or wooden clamps for resisting, sodium chloride or common salt or sodium sulphate, small jugs or containers to make dye paste, glass or plastic measuring cylinders, measuring spoons, weighing scale, steel tumblers, steel, wooden, glass rod for stirring, burner, rubber gloves, scissors, steam iron and a face mask. These are the materials required for batik printing. Bleached and scoured cotton cloth, natural wax, paraffin wax, frame to stretch the fabric, masking tape or dressmaker's pins, brush or block to apply. These are the materials required for dyeing and removing wax. Naphthol dyes, diazosols, turkey red oil, caustic soda, tubs and buckets, water, weighing scale, small jug or container to make dye paste, plastic cups, glass or plastic measuring cylinders, measuring spoons, glass, stainless steel or fiberglass rods to stir dyes, rubber gloves, soap, face mask, detergent and electric iron. Now let us move on and learn the process of tie dye. Follow these steps to tie dye. Transfer the design to stiff plastic and pierce the pattern with a thick needle. The holes should not be too close. Put the plastic over the prepared cloth and lightly mark through the holes with a soluble marker. To make the resist, pinch up a little pieces of cloth and bind it tightly with heavy thread. Create different patterns by changing the space of tying. The thread has to be wound and tied tightly to prevent dye penetration. The thread can be carried over to the next knot rather than needing it to be cut after each binding. If the thread is tied around only the cloth, a tiny spot of color remains in the center resulting in a circle. If a small object such as a pebble or a bean is tied up in the cloth, 
the center is much bigger. Do not tie all the dots in one go. Leave some of the tying and dyeing with subsequent colors. This is an example of single tying. This is an example of double tying at separate intervals. This is an example of multiple tying at separate intervals. Alternately, the cloth can be folded and tied. A tie dyeing method used in India for turban cloths known as laharia. Fine cloths such as muslins can be folded in a concentric manner and tied tightly at intervals. It is dipped quickly in dye of a pale color. Some areas are then unrolled and the process is repeated with progressively darker dyes to build up a range of colors in stripes. The images here show resistage in place and drawing together on the thread. This technique can be used for many effects. Fold the fabric in half and draw shapes as desired with a pencil or chalk and stitch around the shapes in running stitch. Then pull the threads together as tight as possible before fastening. Tie stones or large beans into the fabrics for circles. Alternately for larger or smaller effects try coins, chickpeas, rice or even shells. Use thread to secure and tie the fabric in place. Refer to the images on how this can be done. Mark random points on the fabric with your pencil or chalk. Pick up these marked points and tie a knot in the fabric at that point. You can refer to the images on this how this can be done. Crumple the fabric in your hand and bind it into a tight hard ball. For each color, crumple the fabric in different places for a random effect. For a large garment, bunch along the length, section by section for a long firm roll. Crumple the fabric in the hand and bind it into a tight hard ball for each color. Crumple the fabric in different places for a random effect. For a large garment, bunch along a length section by section for a long firm roll. Displayed here is an example of resist pattern by folding technique. Knotting can be done by tying a length of fabric with equally spaced knots along it. Twist the fabric lightly so that it coils back on itself. Bind it at the ends and at intervals along the coiled fabric. Dye the cloth by first using the palest color. Dye can be mixed in the same way or as for applied resist dyeing. The fabric should not be left too long in the dye to prevent color penetration through the threads. Rinse and dry the fabric and then tie more knots to reserve areas for the second knot. Knots already tied should not be untied. Dye the fabric again with the next palest color. The process of tying and dyeing can be repeated often provided dye colors go from light to dark. Rinse and dry after each dyeing. After the last dye, untie all the twist of the threads, wash the fabric in detergent and press firmly. This is tie dyed fabric in multiple colors. This is another picture 
of tie dyed fabric in multiple colors. For the dyeing process, the minimum material to liquor ratio is 1 is to 30. The liquor refers to the total volume of solution of dye stuff dissolved in water. To prepare the stock solution, accurately weigh 2 grams of dye stuff. Paste it thoroughly using water. Add small amounts of hot water to the paste and dissolve it completely. If necessary, the solution can be heated until it becomes clear. Dilute the solution to 100 ml with cold water. This solution is called 2% stock solution. From this solution, pipe out the calculate amount of dye solution. The calculations for the amount of stock solution and the amount of water that is required are displayed here. Weight of the fabric into shade percentage amount of stock solution required in ml equals to percentage of stock solution. Amount of water required equals to weight of fabric into ml ratio amount of stock solution required. To dye a fabric, take desized covered and bleached cotton yarn or fabric of 20 cm by 20 cm size. Tie the fabric by any one of the methods covered in the course that is folding, pleating, spiraling, twisting, coiling, marbling, simple tying or thritic. Immerse it in water bath for 10 minutes. Prepare the stock solution separately. Take the calculated amount of stock solution. Add it into the water bath. Maintain the material to liquor ratio at 1 is to 30. Slowly raise the temperature of the water bath up to 90 degrees centigrade. Stir the dye color continuously for 20 minutes. Add the calculated amount of sodium chloride to the dye bath. Increase the temperature up to boiling point. Continue dyeing for another 20 minutes. Add another calculated amount of sodium chloride solution to the dye bath. At the end of the dyeing process, take the fabric out of the dye bath, squeeze and rinse it in running water. Repeat the entire procedure to add the next color. For targeting various effects, one may explore the time of exposure and position of the dipping in dye bath. Soak the fabric or yarn in presence of 3 grams per liter of a soap solution and 2 grams per liter of soda ash. Rinse the fabric in cold water and open the fabrics to the see, see the effects of the dyeing and keep it for drying. After drying of the fabric, iron the fabric and mount it with a description of the tying techniques.
wooden blocks to print design guidelines on the fabric. He now uses butter paper to make a stencil, which is more convenient, economical, and time-saving. He has a collection of 300 to 400 stencils of various patterns and designs. Traditional Khatri Muslim patterns include plants, flowers, trees, but no animal or human forms. For other religious groups, designs may include peacocks, elephants, tigers, birds, dancers, medallions, and other geometric designs. Modern designs include a wide variety of lines, zigzags, circles, squares, random dots, and geometric patterns. The design chosen for our shawl is a jackfruit flower. Very often, Jabbar is invited to the National Institute of Design in Ahmedabad to teach design students the nuances of Bandini. There he has met experienced textiles designers who come to Bruges to learn more about the craft and, in turn, have given him new ideas for his own work. These designers often ask Jabbar to create their modern designs in Bandini fabrics. He is also reviving and producing traditional designs that have been considered passé or obsolete. Jabbar perforates the entire design on the butter paper to create the stencil. Pigment is mixed with plain water to make a fugitive dye that is used to transfer the design needle hole dots onto the white or plain colored fabric. The spots are easily washed or bleached out after the tying work is finished. If Jabbar wants the tied dots to be of a color other than white, the fabric is first dyed with that color. The fugitive dye is poured onto a pad composed of layers of jute. When the pad is thoroughly soaked with a dye solution, some kerosene is added to restrict dye spread or bloat, ensuring that the design is printed as very sharp, even dots. If you, if you use the only water, then it will be spread out. So <coughs> kerosene will hold the pressing one. So it doesn't allow to spray. Actually, this is the, for the shoe polish. You use it to rub that brush on the pressing paper. Yeah. And then the small ball get color. We got the white fabric from the market, like uh, Bombay, Bangalore, Sura, from different places of India. And we just cut the fabric as we as per requirement. Uh, suppose we are doing a dupatta for shawl, we cut the fabric two and a half meter. And then we give the the raw stitch for just holding the two layers. This is how we done. Very raw stitch. just to hold the fabric two piece together. 
A length of white or plain colored fabric, usually folded once, is spread on the printing table and the stencil is evenly spread over it. In the past, uh, we are using, instead of the dressing paper, we will use the wooden block for the guideline, for the marking. And each and every block we put separately in, uh, on design. So it takes a long time for making a one piece for the tracing. But now this is the faster and easier technique to do the marking. Mm. Here is the stencil showing the residual dye. The thimble and glass rod facilitate tying. Either silk or cotton thread may be used. The quality and gauge of the thread varies depending on the type of fabric to be tied. Cotton fabric is thicker requiring stronger thread, while silk is thin and delicate in texture so that finer thread may be used. The Bondini tying process begins with the artist using the ring finger of the non-dominant hand to push up from underneath the fabric so as to easily pinch, gather, and hold a bit of cloth using the index finger and thumb of the opposite hand. This finger has a long, sharp, natural nail or may be capped with a pointed thimble to help in raising a tiny cone of the fabric. A glass tube is used to feed off the thread smoothly and speedily around and around the gathered fabric. When the fabric is fully covered, a knot is tied at the tip with the help of the middle finger. The bar employs about 300 artisans from 20 villages in Kutch to do the Bandini tying. Most but not all of the tires are women. Unfortunately, the tires rarely see the end result of their artistry. The first series of dots will be white or another light color if the underlying fabric has been previously dyed. When the first round of tying is finished, the fabric will be dyed and then returned one or more times for further tying sessions if different colors of dots are required by the design. Alternatively, if the textile has been previously dyed with different colors, the series of dots can be tied off at the same time, saving several steps. Favorite colors of dots are yellow, red, pink, orange, and green. This bondini will have orange and the red dots you see she's tying here.
Most textiles have only one color dot, but it's quite common to use two dots. And Jabbar has even seen a fabric with 15 different colored dots. The fabric is frequently brought to the mouth to wet it to allow better purchase for the thread and a finer dot. Payment for the tying work begins with counting all the tied dots on each textile. This number is divided by four as the payment is made in a unit called kadi. Four tied dots make up one kadi. Payment is based on 1,000 kadi. For example, if there are 8,000 dots in one piece, it has 2,000 kadis, and payment is calculated accordingly for 2,000 kadis. The payment for each kadi varies from piece to piece depending on the quality of the work, ranging from 150 to 400 rupees for 1,000 kadis. Using 275 rupees on average, this works out to approximately 6 US dollars and 40 cents for 4,000 dots, or 10 cents for each 63 dots. The number of dots per Bandini textile ranges from 1 to 20,000. A large sari may contain 75,000 dots. Most of the tires are women, but some older men supplement their income by also tying, like Ibrahim here, who is 60 years old. Time required for a Bandini artisan to complete the tying of a piece depends on the number of dots and the size of the cloth. A simple design requires less time than a very intricate one. It also depends on the artisan. 
If the tire is married with children and has lots of family and household chores, she may not be able to give much time to her tying and therefore it may take several weeks or months to finish her work. On the other hand, a young girl and married and with not much responsibility in her family can devote much more time to her work and may finish more pieces in a given period, even though she may work more slowly than a more experienced tire. Here is our shawl with the ties in place ready for the dye bath. Textiles may be colored using natural dyes and chemical dyes. Natural dyes take longer as the recipes usually require much more time to prepare and use than chemical dyes. Chemical dyes are readily available, cheap, and offer a wider range of bright colors than natural dyes, which are more earth tones and muted. The whole piece is bleached in hydrosulfate to remove the tracing dyes that was placed to make the guideline dots for the tires. The textile is washed thoroughly in water to remove the hydrosulfate. This process has already been performed for our textile. Jabbar mixes an alum solution to soak the textile in for 45 minutes before dyeing. Alum is a mordant, which allows the cloth to take up the dye more evenly. The cloth is washed thoroughly in plain water to remove most of the alum solution, but some remains as a mordant. Our textile will be dyed with alizarin and dawadi flowers, which will produce a deep red color. Alizarin is a natural dye obtained from the root of the matter plant. It is one of the most stable of the natural pigments. Dawadi flowers is a relative of the chrysanthemum plant and also develops a red pigment. Jabbar can use a single pot of dye to dye many textiles over a several day period. Textile is rinsed once again in water to ready it for the dye bath. The 
The textile is left in the dye bath for about 45 minutes and must be continuously agitated to ensure even uptake of the dye. Just plain water. See, it doesn't bleed. Yeah. But if you use the uh, acid type, Kentucky, when you wash it, it will be bleed. To achieve darker shades, portions of the piece are dipped in a solution that is produced when scrap iron is left to rust in water for 15 days, mixed with jaggery, a concentrated sugarcane syrup. The deep, dark red shade increases the longer the textile is exposed. Then the cloth is washed thoroughly and dried in shade. more darker than this. First, you have to dye into the marabalum, treat with the marabalum, and then you put in the iron water, it comes almost black. When the piece has dried completely, it is ready to be opened or untied. If the fabric is pulled in a straight line, it may be damaged and torn. Therefore, it must be pulled diagonally. 
It is pulled until all the threads untie and pop off. Now the pattern can be seen. Today, Bandini is produced for both the Indian domestic and international markets. Opportunities are rapidly expanding as this exquisite art has been discovered by international designers and has now entered the world of high fashion. Textiles appealing to Western taste are made into scarves, stoles, bandanas, and sewn into one-of-a-kind or ready-to-wear garments of many designs, shapes, and sizes such as blouses, dresses, and jackets. Interior designers have also found a place for the color of Bondini in their work. Jabbar will be taking this pile of Bondini to trade shows in Paris and Los Angeles. Yes. So we have some colors like lemon yellow, golden yellow, and brown. First, we are testing the color. some acetic acid in it. Now we are working this in plain water to just remove the excess color. Dry, but not like uh, completely dry, but a little bit wet to, to fold the fabric. This I'm measuring according to the length of fabric. So it should be like equal fold at the end. Thank <laughs> you. 
azimuth 2.25 meter long. So I need this. 30 centimeter for one part. This part will be the one. This is my uh, first unit, only double fold, four fold. So this is now six uh, yeah. So this is like three part of uh, one pattern. And we will folding also the different thing again. So there we uh, fold it in square. But now we are folding. Uh, Triangle.
So we have some colors like lemon yellow, golden yellow, and brown. First, we are testing the color. We add some acetic acid vinegar. Now we are putting this in plain water to just remove the excess color. like dry but not like uh, completely dry but then we to wet to, to fold the fabric. So this I am measuring according to the length of fabric. So it should be like equal fold at the end. This is 2.25 meter long, so I need this 13 centimeter for one part. This part will be the one. This is my uh, first unit, only double fold, four fold. So this is now six uh, years. So this is like three part of uh, one pattern. And we will folding also the different again. Later we uh, fold it in square. But now we are folding. Uh, Uh, 
the claim as a claim for this is the target. Dirty because we use over and over the same thing. The materials you'll need are fabric or an item of clothing, writ dye, rubber bands, salt which is optional, a container for dyeing, a spoon, rubber gloves, a measuring cup, and also plastic to cover your workspace, and a pot for boiling water. For best results, use a fabric made from natural fibers like cotton and pre-wash the fabric. Wet fabric takes dye better than dry fabric, so soak it in warm water and wring it out. I'm going to tie the fabric in three different ways. First, I'm going to create a bullseye effect. Lay the fabric flat, pinch the middle, and pull up. Wrap rubber bands around the fabric, spacing them out as much as you want. The more places you tie rubber bands, and the tighter you wrap the fabric, the more white space will be left when you dye it. 
the dye won't be able to fully penetrate those areas. Next, I'm going to create a stripe effect by folding the fabric like an accordion. Wrap rubber bands around it like before. You can alternate which direction you're folding the fabric as you add the rubber bands. The last pattern will be small circles. Pinch pieces of fabric and tie it with rubber bands. Repeat until the fabric is covered. The less fabric you wrap, the smaller the resulting circles will be. Make sure your workspace is covered with plastic or something to protect it from staining. Heat at least enough water to easily cover the fabric. With the water near boiling, pour it into a container. Put on rubber gloves and add the dye, shaking it first. I'm using denim blue writ dye. If you're dyeing cotton, rayon, or linen fabric, Adding salt will help the dye absorb better. Thoroughly stir the dye bath. The amount of dye you use will depend on the color you want to achieve, the amount of water you're using, and the amount of fabric. Place the fabric into the dye and let it sit for at least half an hour. You can move it around and open up some of the folds a little to allow the dye to get deeper into the fabric. If you want to use more than one color, you can pour different colors on different areas of the fabric. Set your container on an angle or put the fabric on a rack so the colors don't pull together. Pour on the dye and rotate the fabric to get all sides. I'm using petal pink, tangerine, and lemon yellow rip dye. Make sure the fabric is saturated with dye and let it sit for at least half an hour. Rinse in warm water, then cold until the water runs clear. Take off the rubber bands as you rinse. Machine wash on cold and hang dry. With these three ways of tying fabric, you can create a bullseye, stripes, and small circles. Now, that we have seen process of tie dye, let us look at the process of creating batik. The palace courts. Keratonan in two cities in central Java are known for preserving and fostering Batik traditions. Surakarta Solo City Batik The traditional Surakarta court Batik is preserved and fostered by the Shushu Hunan and Mange Kune Garan courts. The main areas that produce Solo Batik are the Lavean and Kauman districts of the city. Solo Batik typically has sogan as the background color. Pasar Klevar near Susu Hunan Palace is a retail trade center. Yogyakarta Batik Traditional Yogya Batik is preserved and fostered by the Yogyakarta Sultanate and the Pakua Laman court. Usually, Yogya Batik 
has white as the background color. Fine batik is produced as Kampung Taman district. Bering Haro Market near Malioboro Street is well known as a retail batik trade center in Yogyakarta. Priyangan batik or Sudanese batik is the term proposed to identify various batik cloths produced in the Priyangan region, a cultural region in West Java and Northwest Java, Banten. Traditionally, this type of batik is produced by Sudanese people in the several districts of West Java such as Siamis, Garut and Tasikmalia. However, it is also encompasses Kuningan Batik which demonstrates Seribon Batik influences and also Bantin Batik that developed quite independently and have its own unique motives. The motives of Priyangan Batik are visually naturalistic and strongly inspired by flora such as flowers and swirling plants and fauna such as birds, especially peacocks and butterfly. The cloth needs to be washed to remove any starch or finishes. Next, the fabric may be cut to the required dimensions, keeping in mind the small allowance of 5 to 7 cm for pinning the fabric to the frame. The material should be stretched as taut as possible to ensure the accurate application of wax. If a frame is not being used, then the fabric must be made smooth and flat and should be laid on a sheet of greaseproof paper. There are a number of ways to transfer the design onto the fabric. The chosen design may be traced with a soft pencil or dissolvable marker on the material with the help of a tracing sheet. If the material is sheer or transparent, the design may be traced directly or by placing the material over the design on a light colored surface. The design appears clearly through the fabric and can be traced with a soft pencil. The process of applying wax to the fabric. Newspapers or plastic sheets must cover the work surface before starting the wax application. Paraffin wax and beeswax may be mixed in a ratio of 60 is to 40 to achieve a good quality of resist in the fabric. This mixture needs to be heated in a utensil. The wax should be heated slowly till it gains a flowing consistency like that of a water. To test whether the wax is ready to be applied a small drop of the molten wax may be dripped onto the edge of a fabric. If it looks transparent, it means the wax is ready. On the other hand, if the wax looks opaque on the fabric, then it needs more heating. The heating of the wax should be continued at a lower temperature to avoid solidification. The wax may be applied by a nylon bristle brush starting with the areas that needs to be kept white. After the first dyeing, the wax may be applied further to the areas that need to retain the first dye color. Wooden and metal blocks may also be used to apply wax. In Indonesia, a special tool called canting is used to apply wax onto the fabric to create intricate batik patterns. 
the back of the cloth has to be checked from time to time to ensure that the wax has penetrated the cloth and wherever required the cloth may be re-waxed from the backside too. It is quite difficult to remove the wax once applied. Therefore, one needs to be careful during the process of application of the wax. To remove any unwanted area, the wax has to be scraped gently with a knife from both sides of the fabric followed by rubbing a metal spoon that has been immersed in boiling water. The treatment may be repeated until all the wax is removed. The fabric resisted through wax in batik is dyed in naphthol or azoic dyes which are called coal dyes. Since they are neither involved in heating of the dye bath or the process of dyeing nor do they require any heat or steam fixing. Naphthol dyes require immersion in two different sets of baths which should not be mixed together. The first bath is the naphthol bath to saturate the fiber. To this bath an alkali is added usually caustic soda to make the dye solution. The second bath contains the color salts called the diazo salts that instantly develop the color on the fabric on reaction with the naphthol. Naphthol dyes have coded letters as suffix to their names. The colors achieved in dyeing depends on the combination of the particular naphthol with the particular salt. Thus, one naphthol base can be used with different salts to yield different colors and vice versa. The display table lists some of the common colors achievable through the combination of naphthol and salts. The display table lists some common colors achievable through the combination of naphthol and salts. This table gives the standard recipe for the dye bath for 1 liter of water. To make the alkali solution, measure 441 grams of sodium hydroxide which is caustic soda and add it to 1 liter of cold water. Stir until it dissolves. This solution can be stored and used repeatedly. The solution should be labeled carefully and direct skin contact should be avoided. To make the naphthol bath, take 2 grams of naphthol in a plastic or glass jug. Mix a paste of the naphthol by adding a little TRO. Add 250 ml of boiling water to dissolve the powder. Immediately add 5 ml of alkali solution one drop at a time until the naphthol is clear and yellow. If the naphthol does not clear, the solution should be reheated and stirred. Dilute the solution to 100 ml. Cool the naphthol for 5 minutes and then add sufficient cold water to make up to 1 liter. This bath should be kept away from direct sunlight. To mix the diazo salt bath. For a medium dye shade, measure 4 grams of azo salt powder. Mix it into a paste with little cold water. Add enough cold water to make it up to 1 liter. For dyeing, one needs to ensure that the dye bath is wide enough to submerge and move 
the waxed cloth. The waxed cloth may be gently immersed in the dye bath, keeping it as flat as possible to avoid the development of cracks at this stage. If fine lines are deliberately required, then the fabric should be gently crumpled to get the effect. This creates small cracks through which a little amount of dye color penetrates the design and yields fine cracks in it. To dye, take the desized scoured and bleached cotton fabric on which wax is applied. Put the rubber gloves and immerse the fabric in naphthol solution. Run the fabric gently in solution for 5 minutes. Lift the cloth and allow the drips to fall back into the bath. Hang the fabric for 10 minutes away from natural sunlight. Any naphthol that drips into the diazo salt bath exhausts it. Place the sample for developing the color in the salt bath. Next, agitate a little and keep it in the bath for 5 minutes. Run it through the base solution for 20 minutes. Take the material out and hang for a while. Do not squeeze the fabric and rinse the fabric in cold water. The dye shade looks darker in wet fabric. To get a better idea, the same should be held up against the light to view the actual shade. The naphthol dye colors can also be developed on a localized area using the following method. Dip the wax resist fabric into the naphthol and alkali bath and then allow it to dry completely in air avoiding direct sunlight. Mix a concentrated diazo salt solution and use it to paint with sponge or spray onto the fabric. Dry it completely by hanging in the shade. The fabric may now be washed using the method described to remove the wax. Repeat the dye process in the appropriate naphthol and diazo salt baths to develop the next color before protecting the previous shade with application of wax. Further waxing may be done after the cloth dries. Some waxed areas may also need re-waxing if they are put through several dyeing cycles. These diagrams illustrate the dyeing sequence of colors from light to dark and the waxing of areas for a fish motif. Dyeing the cloth in the first color which is yellow after the application of wax on the areas that have to be kept white. Dyeing of the cloth in the second color that is the red color after the application of wax on the areas that have to be kept yellow. Dyeing of the cloth in a third color, indigo blue, after the application of wax on the areas that have to be kept red. This is the final look of the design on the fabric after removal of wax. The first dyeing gave yellow, the second gave the red and the last dyeing gave the reddish purple due to over dyeing of the red areas with blue. The two main processes to remove the wax from the fabric are boiling and ironing. In boiling, the wax flakes may be removed as far as possible from the fabric. Next, the fabric may be completely immersed 
in a large pan fully filled with hot water which should then be made to boil for 2 to 3 minutes. The fabric should then be transferred to a bucket of cold water. This solidifies a lot of wax which may be later removed by a strainer. The boiling process should be repeated again but with only one minute of boiling. The process may be repeated for heavily waxed fabrics. Finally, the fabric should be boiled in water containing detergent followed by rinsing to remove all the last traces of wax. In ironing, the flaking off should be done as described before. Next, the fabric should be placed between layers of absorbent paper on several sheets of newspaper. The fabric should be ironed properly, constantly changing the newspaper as it gets saturated with wax. Any dye left on the surface of the fabric must be wiped off before ironing. This may continue until all the wax is removed. A final boil in hot water with detergent or treatment by a liquid solvent may be necessary if wax marks remain. All the wax collected as flakes and sieved from the boiling may be recycled and used in future batik applications. The collected wax may be boiled in water to remove any dye color or impurity and cooled off to get an upper layer of solidified wax. Every journey of a thousand miles begins with one small step, and it is very much the same with batik production. The worker here is cleaning the floor, because applying the dyes by hand is very messy, and the floor needs to be cleaned before the next fabric can be processed. Once the floor has been cleaned, the workers start putting down long sheets of plastic on the floor, some sort of linoleum type product. The reason they put this here is to hold the white fabric that has been wet with water. The white fabric is put on these long sheets of plastic and the workers begin the process of folding. Folding the fabric allows the dyes to penetrate unevenly, which enhances the batik effect. The fabric is then folded into a pattern that reduces the width from 44 inches to about 24 inches, and it reduces the length from 15 yards to about 8 yards. After the fabric has been completely folded, the workers start applying the dye stuff to the fabric. Using a natural sea sponge about the size of a tennis ball, the workers start applying circle-shaped blocks of color on the fabric. The first color applied is red, and you can see how the worker applies this color, leaving space for blue and yellow to follow. It is a mini assembly line. One worker applies the red, another the blue, and finally a third worker applies the yellow. It is just beautiful, even at this stage. One thing to note is that these colors will only show up in the printed batik design, or the motif as it is called in the tray. It will be protected by hot wax and then removed from all other areas later in the production process. The third worker is just about finished applying the yellow color, and once it is complete, the fabric is taken out of the workroom for the next production step. Now that the motif colors have been applied to the folded fabric, you can see the workers carrying the long plastic sheet of linoleum out into the bright sunshine. Sun is such an important part of the teak production. 
Since the reactive dyes have not yet been fixed or cured to the fabric, drying them in the sun will fade them slightly. The workers are now sprinkling soda ash, which is a fixative, onto the fabric. They are sprinkling it on in a random or haphazard fashion, and wherever that powder hits the fabric, it's going to cause that area underneath to be just a little bit darker than the surrounding areas that's fading in the sunlight. This increases the random variation in color that is a unique characteristic of batik fabrics. After a batik process, sometimes uh, there's white areas that are not dyed. So the bolt of fabric is hung up on this uh, wooden wall and the workers take little dye sponges to eliminate the white areas so that uh, the whole area of the batik has color. Now that the motif colors have been inspected and all of the white spots have been touched up by hand, it's time to take the fabric to the water glass machine in order to properly fix the colors onto the fabric. A solution of water and soda ash that the locals call water glass is poured into a single bath jig washing machine. Each yard of fabric runs through the bath for about five to six seconds and once the entire batch is complete, it has to sit for about two hours for the dyes to be fully set in the cotton. Rather than sit around here and wait, let's take a quick trip to a factory that makes batik stamps out of copper so we can see how they are made. Most batiks in Indonesia are made in central Java, in and around the small city of Solo. As you can see, the environment around these small batik workshops is very rural, residential, even agrarian in some senses. There's a bunch of rice paddies and farms that we passed along the road. Here we are, driving along the back roads of Solo, on our way to the stamp making facility. And I hope this gives you an idea of the local area that surrounds the batik workshops. Making copper stamps is a complicated process, one that starts, of course, with the original artwork. But because copper stamps are made of folded bits of metal, there is a limitation to the amount of detail that can be shown, especially when you compare it to pen and ink on paper. Here you see the technician modifying the original artwork, removing some of the detail so that it comes into a format that can be translated into the copper. Once the design has been modified, the next step is for the worker to begin forming the copper strips into the pattern design. This involves a lot of cutting, bending, and clamping in order to manipulate the copper strip to fit into the pattern design. You can see that it's a very intricate and complicated process and takes a lot of time. Workers then tap those designs onto a metal frame in order to complete the stamp. Once all the elements are in place, the stamp is dipped into a solution that is made up of melted tree lacquer called telenbun. The lacquer is boiled in a metal pot over a wood fire. The stamps are put into the metal pot and allowed to soak there for about 20 to 30 minutes. It is then allowed to dry and is polished. After this process, the lacquer holds the thin metal strips together and does not allow them to move when the stamps are pressed onto the fabric. Now that the stamp's been made, it's time to go over to the stamping room where the workers put the motif colored fabric onto tables and dip the stamp in a solution of paraffin and beeswax that's been melted. And you can see him placing the stamp uh, in the pattern and making sure everything lines up. And it's really not at all as easy as it looks. Uh, I've tried to do this many, many times and have lots of practice. And still, these guys won't let me near the stamping room.
Now that I've been kicked out of the uh, stamping room, uh, it's time to take the fabric over to the next production step, uh, which is bleaching the fabric. As you saw before, the workers stamp the fabric with the hot wax. That wax protects the colors underneath it. Basically, you're going to use the bleach solution to remove all the color from that beautiful tie-dyed fabric. It's really a pity to waste all that color, but it's absolutely necessary uh, in order to complete the batik production. The wax protects the red, blue, and yellow colors uh, that that pattern was stamped on. And the bleach solution removes uh, those colors everywhere else on the fabric. It basically will leave white or light tints of color uh, where those bright, vibrant colors were there before. And at the end result of the bleaching process, you're going to see basically a white fabric ground with the pattern uh, being colorful. Now, it's a very delicate process, the bleaching. Uh, if you do it for too long, the bleach will penetrate the wax and destroy those motif colors. If you do it for too short of a time, uh, you won't uh, remove enough dye from the ground. So it's real tricky and has to be monitored very carefully. This is a different process here. First, first color is dying. Since we just finished bleaching all that beautiful color from the fabric in the previous step, we have to now begin the process of replacing those colors with the ground colors. Unless you want to leave the fabric being mostly white with a little bit of tint of color and the flower motif design being red, blue, and yellow, we have to start dyeing the ground. And in this instance, we start with a tan or tea color dye bath. The worker manipulates the 15 yards of fabric into a half of plastic barrel that's been converted into a dye bath. He's just about finished the first lot and he's going to hang it on a pole so that the excess dyes drip back into the container and you don't waste too much. Because the fabric absorbed a lot of the dye, a worker is replacing some liquid into the half barrel and a new batch of the just bleach fabric will be brought to the bath. He begins the immersion process, pushing that 15 yards down into the barrel, um, moving it a bit, making sure that the dye penetrates uh, throughout the fabric and the different folds. Uh, it, it's a very thin liquid, and it will penetrate very nicely into the cotton fabric. When he finishes manipulating the fabric, again, he's going to hang it on the pole and allow the excess dye to drip back. Uh, another worker is squeezing out uh, the remaining uh, uh, wet areas of the first batch, and once that's complete, he will bring it for the next step. Now that the fabric has just been dyed in that light tan or tea color, the worker puts it on a clean piece of linoleum that's been placed on the floor. He begins folding it in the same exact way that he did with the white fabric that was done at the beginning of the production process. You can see him scrunching the fabric, reducing the width by about half and the length by about half. This folded pattern allows the dyes to be applied unevenly and haphazardly. The fabric looks great like this, but the ground looks a little flat, so I think we should add a little bit more color to it. This is the technique for the first color, and then we have two colors. Using bottles that remind me of old-fashioned ketchup dispensers, the worker begins spraying the red color onto the folded fabric. The amount of color coverage is about 30 percent. 
So it's important to dye the fabric that tan color in the initial step of ground dyeing. Here you see the worker beginning the application of the second sprayed color, the blue. And again, it covers about 30% of the fabric. A mini assembly line of sorts is formed here by the three workers. The worker on the left folding the fabric and the two workers on the right spraying the red and blue colors onto the fabric. These two workers are just about finished with the ground spraying technique. The worker in the cream shirt is just about finishing up the red color. He has about uh, two feet more of the fabric to do. And the worker behind him in the red shirt, uh, who's spraying the blue color, has about six or seven feet to go until both bolts are completed. Once the bolts are completed, the workers will drag the linoleum outside and begin the soda ash process. The next two production processes are exact duplicates of the ones that were used after the motif colors were dyed earlier in the production process. Here the workers are dragging linoleum outside so that the fabric that's just been sprayed can dry in the sun. Soda ash is then applied to darken the areas that it touches while the other parts of the fabric fade slightly in the sunlight. Here's a close-up of the fabric after it's been sitting out in the sun for about 15 minutes. After the fabric's been drying in the sun for about 20 minutes, we head over to the water glass machine where the worker is adding a solution into the jig washer. The fabric is then run through exactly the same process that was done to treat and fix the motif colors. After this water glass solution process is finished, the fabric has to sit for another two hours, and instead of hanging around here, I think we should tour a batik museum. My name is Erna Adita. I work in Batik Museum of Donorhati, which is the largest batik museum in Southeast Asia. And I'd love to give you a tour of our facilities. Over the course of the next two hours, Erna gave me quite an extensive tour of the museum. She explained how Chinese traders influenced the design of Javanese batik. She showed me the batiks that were produced and worn by the benefactors of the batik museum. She explained how the nobility and other different castes in Javanese society could only wear certain batik designs. She told of how during the Dutch occupation, European fairy tales and art were incorporated into the local batiks. I want to thank her for the excellent tour she gave me. From my visit, I learned so much about the different periods and styles of traditional Indonesian batiks. Now that we're back at the batik workshop, the first order of business is to start a fire. Workers use wood to heat a cauldron of water. The cauldron contains about 30 to 40 gallons of water, and it is brought to a boil. The fabric that has just come from the water glass process has had been sitting for two hours is now fully fixed. The colors will not fade or come off uh, after the immersion into this boiling liquid. Another bolt of fabric is going to be added to the cauldron. Uh, I think this cauldron can hold about uh, 45 yards in total. The worker begins agitating the fabric to remove all the wax that uh, has been stamped on it. And after a little while, he begins skimming that wax, uh, just like you would a soup that you're, you're making. Uh, they skim the wax off. Uh, the wax is reused. And um, once the wax has been removed, they uh, lift it and agitate it some more and begin to put it on a metal pole. Now this is the most dangerous part of fatigue production because what could happen 
is that the fabric can fall from that pole after agitation and the boiling water will splash onto the worker like that and it's really not a lot of fun. Now that both bolts of fabric have been uh, removed from the cauldron of hot water and uh, the wax has been removed from the fabric, we now are about to begin the last process of the teak production. Here the worker is taking the fabric and transferring it to a pool of cold water. Um, both um, pieces of fabric will be put there and then the last step of production is washing the fabric. Uh, it's important to wash the fabric because some traces of wax might still be on the fabric and this has to be inspected by hand and you can see the workers use a brush to, once they identify some wax, they use the brush to scrape it off. And you can see that uh, after a while, some wax residue builds up in the pool of water. And again, this will be skimmed off and reused in future petite production. All the production processes have been completed. The fabric has dried in the sun one final time, and the fabric is finished. Look at how beautiful it is. If you look carefully, you can see the ground colors that were made up of dyed tan with tints of the sprayed blue and red colors. You could also see the blue, red, and yellow motif colors that were sponged on earlier in the production and then bleached out from everywhere except those areas protected by the wax. It is just a beautiful design and I think you can now appreciate the many steps that it took and the toil of all the workers involved over almost two days in order to produce these few bolts of batik fabric. I really enjoyed working on this documentary. I learned a lot about video production and editing. It really makes batik design and production look easy. I hope you enjoyed our brief journey together and learned a bit about how batiks are made. As for me, I am working on designing a new line of batik fabrics and looking forward to my next trip to Indonesia, getting my hands dirty with dye and making some beautiful fabric. Until then... To summarize, in this unit, you have learned about the tie-dye and botic methods of dyeing. Thank you.